I mean, we've probably taken like 40K in revenue since starting. To be honest, where it helped us most were, was like actually looking at our operations. Hey, yo, everyone. I'm here with Will and Oli, who have been growing their startup Fudu in UK, food tech space. So yeah, Will, Oli, just give a brief intro about Fudu and your story with it. Uh, okay, so Fudu is... Uh, uh, an online platform where we provide uh, websites and apps and online ordering for takeaways and restaurants. Uh, currently, we're just based in the UK, but uh, we have plans to expand to other countries. Fantastic. Okay. And how long have you been working on it so far? Uh, so I've been working on Foodoo for, I think it's nearly five years. Nice. So I would say that Oli is handling everything sales related well for Will everything else related right uh yeah all he's been he's been more of a firefighter though, these days to be honest nice okay uh, yeah because i remember basically from the moment you joined i think so much focus has gone into how we can nail onboarding because i guess after just few weeks of you joining we booked out your entire schedule and we had to put a wait list in your product or it was what, what was situation like uh, yes, so we really had to focus on um, our onboarding system and uh, yeah, just, just the, our internal systems couldn't cope with, uh, you know, higher amounts of sales. So we've, we've really, uh, we've really refined uh, what we, what we're doing. And it's actually, it's actually going pretty well now. Um, we, we ended up getting it taken on two employees uh, that they know our system inside out as of now, and um, they just manage everything. So it's great. I mean, we're finally able to like put our phones away and not pay attention uh, to, to what the customers are saying anymore. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And you know, we started doing some quick mess with you just before recording this one regarding like cash collected from the moment you joined the program. What was it like? Uh, yeah, so I mean, we've probably taken like forty k in revenue since starting. Awesome. Uh, what would you say about the program overall and how it was for you? Uh, so I think um, we we learned a lot of good techniques for for selling online, but I think uh, to be honest, where it helped us most were, was like actually looking at our operations and uh, refining. Uh, what we were actually doing so we so that we could put ourselves in a better position to grow and i would say that we're only just reaching that that place now really um, Fair. because you as i remember you were focusing so much on yeah we had to focus and dial in the operation side of things because what in our second third week we booked out all the like customer slots and that, that's why because as you have some hardware inside inside your startup as well and it's like had to mix the hardware side of things with the other part and this took us like few months of play, placing it all out right uh yeah it, it's um to be honest we we were working with quite a complicated system and actually there were two systems mm -hmm. and um uh yeah it, it was it was just a mess really like people just people calling us shouting down the phone asking for changes like threatening to leave that kind of thing and uh so we had to we had to make sure that the customers we already had were happy and not leaving and um and things were growing through referrals just fine anyway so yeah that's that's basically how what helped you in solving this churn problem because i'm sure yeah when you have to constantly be on the phone with people shouting and screaming at you and always complaining. This is not a dream life you envisioned as a, like, as a startup founder. Uh, no. By churn, do you mean people wanting to leave or people? Yeah, leave? yeah, yeah. Like them okay, calling so... you and saying, I'm done with this. Yeah. So, ironically, no one ever leaves. We've had one big customer leave ever in the whole time that we've uh, been running this. And, and, and this is one thing we're starting to realize now is like, these systems get so ingrained in, in another business's systems that actually swapping it for something else is, is a big deal. So we'd have to really 
really like get under their skin if they wanted to change. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, luckily for us, we can kind of we can kind of break things a bit and test new stuff out, uh, and and it's it, it's just okay. So yeah, it's been a yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's just it's been a learning process, you know. Like we've been, uh, we we're still we're still understanding where to focus our energy, really. And what would you say would were like and have been your key learnings from the program? We we have we have learned the principles of uh, of selling online, um, and yeah, we, we 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 definitely plan to like execute uh, at some point. But uh, like I said, we we've, we've been uh, we've been Uh, working on our operations. Awesome. Okay, and I remember this one week. So, how did it even come to a situation when you booked out your calendar with more people than you could handle? How do you think this has turned out like this? Uh, well, we just we run referral schemes. Uh, so, um, if you tell if you tell a restaurant owner that that has, ju has just agreed to sign up for our, uh, our online ordering. And you say to them, look, we'll give, so we sell printers with our websites because they need to receive the order somehow. And we just say to them, look, we'll give you a free printer if you can refer us to one of your friends. I remember one day we did that seven times in a row. And we, so we went to one restaurant and said to the guy, look, we'll give you a free printer if, if uh, you refer us. And then we, he took us to his friend, <laughs> he said yes. And then we did the same thing again, walked to another restaurant <laughs> with the owner and just repeatedly did that. And yeah, in, in one day, you know, we had like work for a full week. It, yeah. I mean, that, yeah. And uh, if, for example, reflecting on all that, like what would you tell to yourself at the start of the journey? Say, imagine you meet Will, who is like a few years younger, what would you tell to him to make his journey easier? Oh, this, okay, let, let me, let me try and summarize that. I would say, I would say put a cap on how much you want to spend in your development. For sure. <laughs> the soft, software development, like make sure that there is a limit to how long that pro that project's going to go on for and how much you're going to spend. And I mean, realistically, you can sell something that works 10% of the time. Sales is probably 20% of, uh, of, of what the business is, is eventually like going to be. That That's really where your resources uh, should lie. So try and get to try and get to a point, uh, try and get to a point where you have a product that you can sell really hard as quickly as possible. Wow, yeah. I think with such setup, it would be impossible to fail. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Fair>. definitely. <laughs> cool. And um, what has inspired you to start this venture? Uh, well, our dad ran an e-commerce platform. Uh, so I, if, I, I'm kind of talking to the video here, but our dad ran a, an e-commerce platform um, before Ollie and I joined. So Ollie and I brothers, that's, that was what I was going to say. And um, he he bootstrapped our business and uh, like gave us the the like original platform that we built on top of. And yeah, we just ran with it and thought it was a good idea. That's Why you decided to go this route instead of some high paying software job? Uh, I asked myself that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't know. The, the freedom's pretty nice. Yeah, and uh, like I, I, I like to, I like to think I'm not limited in in what I, I can earn doing this. Yeah, because you know, you come up with the idea of uh, giving a free printer to one customer to, for referral, and then all of a sudden, you, for example, can make your monthly earnings just like in one weekend right yeah sweet yeah. i remember you mentioned to me a few times that you go to a gym a lot how do you combine this with your startup life uh, i mean I, I i think that they they play hand in hand 
really it's not um it's not it's not so it's not so difficult for me to to balance that you bring your laptop to the gym these days never i've never ever done that no <laughs> but the gym is good though i, I mean uh, so and i've been going to like quite um quite serious uh training gyms for the last like four or five years where you, you meet people that are uh very into training and more often than not like you, you you'll meet other business owners doing the same thing like you know people are serious about their self-development go to these places so it's a good place to network and also uh to to get in shape but you know yeah. I've, i mean i've met um i i I met and trained with a few times. I don't. Do you know Stephen Bartlett, the the dragon from Dragons Den? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe I, he's from Scotland or something. No, no, he's a uh, from Manchester. The Diary uh, of the CEO guy. Okay, yeah. He used to he used to go to my gym in London, and uh, we trained a bit. You I mean, ah, uh, yeah. Now I remember him. Uh, but yeah, and, and he, he obviously, he, he had, he knew a lot of people in there that also like ran businesses and stuff. So it, yeah, it was, it was cool. You know, what do you think of those gyms where, because you say you go to the serious weightlifting once, what do you think of gyms where you come and they complain at you when you drop the weights, um, and, uh, stuff like that? Um, <laughs> I mean, I would never ever go anywhere like that. <laughs> I think that I think that that's fine. If that's the environment you want to be in, then I'm not gonna, I'm not going to be there to to disturb <laughs> with you. Yeah. Piece. yeah, like I just I wouldn't go. <laughs> Because I think you know there is a uh, few gym chains, and what they've done is that they, they looked at okay, what are the most popular machines that are used by people who go to the gym every day. And there is like a death lift um, and stuff like this, you know, and they removed it all so that their gyms would, the only guys who would be signing up would be those who never come. Yeah. So that they could pack like five times as many signups, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like those, those big commercial gyms live on people that don't go to the gym. Like that's how that, that is literally the business model is they want to, They want to deter people that are serious about the gym from going in and, and like wearing the equipment down. But yeah, that's how, that's how that works. What was think, the last time you've been to a commercial gym? So I, 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 uh, obviously I've just moved to Manchester about uh, nearly two months ago now. So I've had to try a few different places. So I've been to them recently and they're yeah. horrible. I hate it. <laughs> Honestly, I hate it so much because you're like, you drop the weights and then, uh, they call the uh i don't know the staff and everyone yeah well these these commercial gyms they are like the opposite of that there are there are no staff so there's just these like revolving doors and and yeah uh, i know you, i know once you were speaking about yeah yeah so you so you go in and everyone's like there's no etiquette like people just leave rubbish out like the the weights are just all over the place um Re normally really busy as well I, i don't i'm not into it it's not good fair okay cool then coming back to the startup life so you're running a food tech uh, startup what would you say i mean sure you got people you're connected with like in other areas so some of them i assume might be like doing drop shipping or nfts what differences you see in scaling a food tech startup comparing with doing some other types of online businesses? I mean, I, I'd, it'd be difficult for me to really comment uh, on the like internals of those businesses because I've never done them. But for me, it, it and I, I don't know if I'm in my own head here or not, but what I'm trying to do feels like really complicated. Like it's hard. It feels like really hard work to get to that point where we have a product ready to, to sell. It just feels like it's like, it's really, it's very complicated. And I, and I feel like, uh, uh, though, so NFTs drop shipping, uh, those things, I, I get it. They are, they're difficult. Um, I would, I understand that, that finding, for example, in drop shipping, finding a product to sell that actually sells is, is quite tricky. There's like an art to it, but, but the, 
I feel like the line to, to do that is kind of a straight one. Like you, you, yeah, yeah, you just research products fairly, buy a few tools and sort of you are set like within a few months, right? Whereas yeah. with a product, it's like you invest years and a good scenario if you end up with something worth sellable, right? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a, you, you're kind of stabbing in the dark a little bit. Like you don't really know until you've done it, whether or not it's going to uh, sell. I mean, obviously you could, you could test beforehand. Uh, and what were some of the things which helped you figure out your product market fit? So for instance, I'm sure say a few years ago, you didn't have, or even like prior to joining, you hadn't had this clear picture of who you need to be selling to. So how have you learned who is like your ideal customer? Uh, we, we, we just uh, went through trial and error and refined it. Uh, so at the, at the start, we just tried to take any restaurant that we could. And then we realized that all restaurants are just as painful to set up, but some but of them, some of them pay 10 times more than others. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them pay a hundred times more than, than the others. And, and like, you can kind of narrow it down by like a few uh, heuristics as to which ones are going to be good and which, and which ones aren't. Yeah. And what are the criteria by which you judge them? I remember you told me something like the, uh, Google maps reviews can give it away. Uh, yeah. So Google, Google reviews, that's a big one. Um, Google reviews are, uh, they, they linearly map to how well they do on, on our platform. Um, yeah, so an established business, uh, whether or not they have delivery. So if, uh, yeah, if they have delivery, they're worth like 10 times more than someone without delivery just straight away. Um, I mean, those, those are the two main ones really. Yeah. And one of the marketing plan, like one of the channels in the marketing plan we went for was like posting content on LinkedIn, even though sometimes we were not as consistent with it as we would like to. Uh, but I remember you, you, like you had some e flow of inbound leads and connections from there as well. Uh, yeah. So the, the LinkedIn, uh, posting that I was doing was working. I was getting, uh, I was getting in front of the right people and, and, uh, actually getting responses from the right people. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the product was in a, in a, a specific place before continuing with that, which is probably the wrong mindset. I mean, I probably should have just kept, kept like compounding it. Um, yeah, but ba basically you're saying that before getting in meetings with guys who run very large food chains and for example, restaurant chains of hundred locations or like couple hundred locations, you wanted to first make sure that you have the product worth showing to them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Now you mentioned that you've recently figured your operational issues with, by hiring decent people. So what are the things you look at when hiring folks now? Um, I mean, so I, I realistically I've been working with, uh, I guess, um, what do you call him? A recruiter. Mm -hmm. And, and he did a lot of the filtering for me. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't choose too much about the people that we got, but the ones, the ones that we did get immediately watched all the tutorials that I made and got, um, and became useful the same day as hiring them. So and they, you know, it's so interesting to see that the right people in the right places, you can see it within like sometimes within the first few hours because, and, uh, with few other hires you're making within weeks and months, you're feeling, okay, sure. They, I'll just give them another week and, or another month, and then they will get up to speed and they never do. <laughs> it turns out because same in my experience, those people who were there to contribute and who actually eventually brought a lot of value, they. I could see their contribution the same day as they joined, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. The thing as well is I think if they didn't do that I, I, right now, knowing what people can be like, I wouldn't think twice about getting rid of them in a, in a few days if they didn't. 
you know what I mean? Like you've got to be, you've got to be kind of harsh because at the end of the day, you're running a business, not a charity. And if, if uh... I love how your mindset changed since the moment I met you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I never recall, recall you speaking phrases like "Yeah, there is uh, not a charity here," so we can get GTA forward <laughs> stuff like that. But I mean, that's true because yeah. there's so many. I mean, your runway is not infinite, and you just can't afford to be hiring wrong people at the start. And that's why I think myself, I also collaborated with a recruiter who I paid what, last week so that they can help me uh, get another ops person for our uh, like SaaS camp. And as mo many of them also work the performance-based model, like half the fee at the start, half at the end or something, it is just so much worth it uh, comparing to spending weeks and months sourcing candidates yourself, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, this is a, th you're going to love this, Dennis. This is a Naval quote, but you need to value, you need to value your time at like crazy hourly rates. So, so Naval. Uh, Naval quote, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I miss those. Yeah. Uh, yeah N and Naval said that even, even before he made any money, he would, he would, uh, see his time worth like $5,000 an hour or something. And if, 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 uh, it would cost less than that to um, outsource it, then you just should just do it. I wonder how he got the initial cash flow to outsource tasks, which are $4,000 an hour, but... Uh, yeah, he, well, he's big on he's big on like investment, isn't he? I don't know, leverage. Fair, and I think I know a couple other entrepreneurs as well who <clears throat> do it a certain way. Well, it's just for many of us, maybe starting at the... 5k an hour figure is a bit of a mindset leap, I would say. However, attaching, say, 200 to 500 bucks an hour already helps you filter out 90% of shit you shouldn't be doing, you know? Yeah. Fair. And currently, for example, after going through all those hires and uh, situations, how do you approach your operations right now? Like, do what are your frameworks for leveling them up and getting more out of this. Uh, so we, um, uh, for, so for customer support, for example, we, we use a service called Trengo. I don't know. Have you ever heard of it? No. Uh, so essentially we now have a, a support WhatsApp number and every message uh, that goes to that WhatsApp number can be shared amongst everyone in the, in the business. Uh, so basically there's a support number and our support is now infinitely scalable. And, and there's like way more, there's, there's way more transparency in, uh, between who's doing what and who's communicated what with who. Uh, it's just out on the table. Everybody can see it. So we have, so I feel like our support is now, um, it is infinitely scalable. We could get, we could get 50 support employees on, on there and it would, it would work perfectly. Because every single one of them would be attached tickets and then you would be able to track them properly. Yeah. Yes. Say so because seven months ago or six months ago, what was your support system like? I mean, we, <laughs> whoever calls you, <laughs> you need to sort it. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we had no tickets and no way of knowing if someone had called somebody else unless unless they mir miraculously remembered to tell you. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, what, what else was like the beginning of the support uh, story for you? Like, like, do you have some other crazy stories which were happening with customers, say, a, a year back? when they would call you at night saying that the printer doesn't work or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's, that's the crux of it. Basically like they, the, yeah, the, the thing is they, they don't care. Like they'll call you. I, uh, I got called at three in the morning, uh, before we got Trengo and that I was literally, I, I had a team meeting the day after. Because I'd already heard about Trengo and I was like, listen, the, the next thing we do is implement this, this service. 
Um, yeah, we must do an insane advertisement placement right now because I think you couldn't sell their platform any better. <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah, it's so much. So much of what we've been doing in the last six months has just been um, like trying to trying to free up mine and Ollie's time. Yeah, because the more free hours you have, the more of them you can invest into high leverage activities, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it's all about high leverage activities. Um, and, and just just get getting a getting like a support message or or just um, something monotonous to do every twenty minutes. It is impossible to concentrate on a big task if you're if that's happening. Uh, so yeah, but now now we have a we have a solid plan for the year. Uh, we have like. We, yeah, we what are, does your vision look like for the next twelve months and next years? Uh, so we want uh, we want to double again this year. So we want to get to twenty k MRR by December of this year. Um, I like the simplicity in your goal setting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems it it feels realistic. Um, but yeah, I mean. I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, we're going to take investment at this point. So, we, like, we don't have the opportunity to. Uh, there are a few reasons for this, but but we're not we're not going to like increase our leverage uh, further at this stage. So yeah, just keep growing. Yeah. But I, I, I know, I know, I think I know what our team would look like at that stage. Um, so I have it mapped out. Um, how many customer support staff, how many salespeople, and uh, yeah, the, the, so the systems that they'll be using. Like I know what that all looks like now in my head. So basically as we grow, every every uh, extra bit of revenue we have, like I know exactly where I'm going to put it. Fair. And yeah, basically you mean that, you know, you said that you're not keen to do the next uh, round yet. At least you don't have some crazy offers, uh, which you would say, yes, absolutely. It's worth it. Is it because as you build up more cash flow and as you gradually increase your MRR, the less financial stress is left on you so that it basically allows you to just breathe easier. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been following a few, um, like business magnates online that, uh, that that was, and the tre they're sort of trending towards like not taking an investment round. Plus, money money nowadays is is kind of expensive. Like it's not a it's it's not the same climate as it was like three or four years ago. I think it, getting in, getting investment money in now is pretty hard. What do you think on the fine like VC market in UK right now? And I haven't gone up to talk to any other startups in northern UK, but any differences you see there as well? I mean, I, I'm, on, I'm only going to regurgitate what I've heard, but apparently it's really, really difficult to get investment right now. And uh, it's, it's almost impossible to take a loan out. Uh, and businesses are closing by the thousand every month. Like it's pretty, it's pretty hard. Tough, tough times. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's rough. rough. Uh, have, you, have you not seen the same thing? You, you know, know? um, I hear three times a day that all VC money has uh, become harder to raise. You, I think that as long as you are sustainably growing and hitting your metrics from quarter to quarter, of course, it puts you in much more advantageous scenario, right? But of, uh, of course, I do see the trend that, for example, a couple of years ago, say, pre product ideas raising what like three to 10 to 15 mil. I think the market has become more conservative regarding that nowadays. And um, yes, yeah, sure. Occasionally I still may meet a few, even every other week I meet startup founders who at the idea slash pre-product pre-revenue stage would be raising 
say three to five mil, but it has become a ton less common because now you don't, yeah, sure. There is like the Theranas, then we work and a uh, few stories like this, but recently I think both me and you have noticed that it's not been as many now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But plus we're, we're in like, uh, we're in a saving climate, I think. Right. So just, just, uh, putting money into IPAs or, or like some kind of, some kind of hedge fund or something has like pretty decent returns right now. So I think a lot of people with money are just doing that. And it, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's like I said, money's expensive. I mean, yeah, right, right now, if, if I had 50 grand, I'd know exactly where to put it. So that, so surely, uh, it, by that logic, I should get a loan or try and raise 50 grand, but it's, it doesn't work like that. Like 50, 50,000 pounds right now is the, the interest rates just don't make sense when you, when you extrapolate over time, what it would take for me to get that money, uh, organically. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it's, yeah, because with, uh, this loan situation and VC funding, I guess you're left to face the reality when you need to be basically getting to most likely bootstrapping to the initial 30, 50 grand in math recurring revenue after which you can, well, most likely decide to pursue it yourself, keep keeping the hundred percent equity or other scenarios, you can raise the next round of funding, but being in much better terms than you otherwise would be. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Lastly, what would you say to the person who is considering to join SaaS camp, but is not sure? Uh, I would say be ready to sell. Uh, and you don't mean sell your soul. You mean, <laughs> no, I mean, sell, I mean, yeah, be, be, be ready to sell everything, your house, your kids, your <laughs> organs. No, no, be ready. Uh, yeah. Be in, be in a position to sell, to make the most out of it because the, the, the methods do work. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Fantastic. Okay, well, thanks a ton for sharing this today. What are different ways to find you? I think you are, are you on LinkedIn these days or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll receive a message on LinkedIn after a day or two. <laughs> An occasional investor offer or it's like a, a request from a large chain, for example. Cool. Yeah, it was awesome to uh, catch up today and looking forward to seeing your upcoming progress.